I'm going to, I'm going to actually go back much earlier than the book, uh, just to the start, uh, to set the context, I suppose, uh, to talk about the forces that drove you into politics from such an early age. What would you, what would you nominate? Um, I was always indignant, even as a kid. Uh, I was always indignant at that bounder and fraud, Menzies. <laughs> Um, uh, that, that, that Edwardian dandy, that, uh, and um, uh, not, that it, uh, not that it helped that we had someone completely hopeless as leader, that was Evert, and then Corwell after, but my father and I would stand on the polling booth and, handing, and I'd run around putting out the leaflets in the in the letter boxes in our square we had in our branch. And every polling day, we lost, you know, for a series of, so you had a lot of elections. You had, um, uh, I think there was 54 and then um, uh, 57, I can't, don't ask me yeah. to remember them all, 60, 61, sorry, 63. They weren't all three years apart, there was a series of them, you know. And uh, the Labor Party just sort of, you know, didn't have the, and yet you knew it was a party of, of good people. It was a party that represented the bulk of the people. And uh, so there was that about it, that is. Um, and uh, the other person, the other thing, of course, was, the other thing I was interested in was, of course, I've often said, Churchill, you know. Um, and even though he was, an old Ed White in himself, but not a dandy. Um, uh, Hardly a dandy. And he was all substance. Um, he was all tip and iceberg, uh, <laughs> not, just, not just tip. Um, uh, I thought, this is, this is the game this guy is in, this is the game to be in. Well, in fact, in uh, your speech uh, launching Graham Frudenberg's book on Churchill, you said, and this was uh, 2008, a couple of three years ago, you said that um, the inspiration for my entry into public life and into the Labor Party itself came from Churchill. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I was attracted to him for his braveness, sense of adventure, compulsion and moral clarity. How old were you when you were thinking that? Oh, 15, 16, 17, yeah. Uh, what were your mates doing? I, I, well, <laughs> my, my, my mother and father bought me a book for my 12th birthday, it was called, it was written by the, the English uh, professor of history, Hugh Trevor Roper, H.R. Trevor Roper, it was called The Death of Hitler by H.R. He was the first one in the bunker in Berlin um, out within eight hours of Hitler's death. So, I mean, I was interested in, in, in things at an early stage and of course I used to, I used to work in the Sydney County Council. Um, uh, here in what's now the Queen Victoria building in George Street and I used to go down to a couple of book dealers in King Street including Berkelow's who were still around and I used to buy Strand magazine from the 30s and Churchill used to write a monthly column in Strand magazine about all sorts of things but these are the years when he was out of course so you'd have reminiscences of the First World War but he wrote, mostly wrote about contemporary things and really about himself. So I had this sort of interest in him, and of course I'd read, you know, you get to read the histories. Uh, so Graham asked me, because of my interest in him, and Graham's interest, Graham Frudenberg's interest in Churchill, he asked me would I launch the book. Mm. And of course I did, and I was pleased to, because of the, you see, you see, um, the British Tory party hated Liberals more than they hated Labor people. Because the Liberal Party, the last Liberal government under Asquith, they, they displaced the, the, Tor the Tory Party. And the, the Conservative majority of 1938 didn't want to ever give the Prime Ministership to, to a bounder like Churchill. Mm. They thought he was a drunk and a bounder. Uh, and uh, of course, Chamberlain collapsed and they would have loved to have given it to their favourite guy who was in the House of Lords. That was Lord Halifax, um, Edward Fox. But of course he didn't have to fight, to fight Hitler. So they gave Churchill the job, but there was an, a sort of a, an unspoken deal. 
that part of the taking of it was he had to make the devil's bargain with Hitler. Because the British establishment wanted a settlement with Hitler, not a war. And when push came to shove, when they said, Winston, we want you to treat, treat with Hitler, negotiate a settlement for the British Empire, he said no. And on that no went Western civilization, you know. Mm. So you, you, you pay on the results. You obviously very early, um, very smart, I would think, that it, it seems that from very early on you were looking for mentors. Is that right? I mean, the association no, I with Lang to, is, is very yeah, well known. No, but... I used to suck experience out of people. It's different looking <laughs> for mentors. You know, uh, this idea, do you have heroes? No, no, I, I don't have heroes. But I have people who, I, 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 people I admire, Churchill was one, of course, Roosevelt another, Curtin, Lang. But what I found was in my young life, how do I truncate experience? How do I, how do I get the distillation of someone else's long years? Someone who can give it to you, someone who actually got it together and is not distorting it, you know? And uh, so um, fr from Lang I got, of course, yeah, you know, he knew every figure. He was at Henry Parks' rallies, you know. Um, and y y you name them, uh, Edmund Barton or uh, Fisher or um, later, of course, Hughes or Bruce or any of these people, Lang knew them all personally. So you've got a pen sketch of what they were like, you know, how they behaved and what their little foibles were and all this sort of stuff. So in the end, it sort of it filled in a lot of them a lot of history, you know, filled in. Of course, when you think about it, I, I knew Lang quite well. I used to see him twice a week for a decade. And how, but when you first, how old were you when you first started seeing him? Um, about 18. Mm. And I, I finished, I used to take him to schools at weekends, I drive him to schools, for high schools and things. But you get this connection, you see, here I am, this is 2011, but there's a connection through Lang back through the early Labor Party, back to Hughes, through, uh, so, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, back to Henry Parks. I mean, you can actually take the drift of Australian public life back that far, and there's a sort of a, a, a somewhat of a connection running but through. But the remarkable thing is this to me, Paul, that you had no formal education beyond 15, yeah. yet you had an immensely curious mind. You obviously had a hunger for knowledge. Yeah. You had already developed a, a, a obvious, an obvious interest in, and from what you're saying, a sophisticated interest in politics, yeah. to be seeking these things out. Where did that come from? Yeah, well, do, you, do you know well, that? Just to find, I think, I used to always try and find out what is the sense of this? What does it mean? Like, for instance, when I first got elected to the House Representative, one of the first people I saw was a guy called Sir Lawrence Hartnett, Larry Hartnett. Oh, yeah. He was the builder of the of the of the of, Holden. The, of the Holden. Yeah, he was Alfred P. Sloan's point man in Australia for General Motors, and and um, if you want to, if you need a if you need a framework to think about Australian manufacturing and the motor vehicle industry in, this is the guy, one of the guys to get it from. So I spent quite a bit of time with him. He used to have a house in Mount Eliza in Victoria. Um, and I'd see him in Melbourne and have the odd lunch. And after a while, he was also head of the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, which built Wirraways and then later Spitfires for the Second World War. So, you know, you had the, the, you had the motor vehicle industry and the aircraft industry, that part of the one we ever had. And, uh, and so you, 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 you end up essentially, and these, these people will generally tell you everything. You know, if you're, if you're listening, well, I mean, if you've got the antennae out, they will give you things. So, um, uh, Goff said to me one day, of course, you seem to have this fascination for old men. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, uh, 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 this You said as long as they're not too fascinated yeah, in me. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is, of course, when I used to have a bit to do with Rex Connor. And I said to Goff, well, of course, if you're Prime Ministership, I mean, I said, then, Goff, I might have an interest in you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 